You know, the story of the origin or the beginning of any nation or institution or movement almost always captures our interest and our imagination. And we often celebrate those kind of origins like we do in this country on the 4th of July. It seems to me that people are sometimes invigorated by looking back to the way it was in the beginning. In today's text from the book of Acts, we're going to see a very significant event at the very beginning of the church. Now, 2,000 years of church history have left us with all sorts of religious systems and theologies and, of course, divisions And I think a lot of times we just long to see what it was like before all that baggage was laid on the body of Christ. Just just what was it like at the very beginning? We long for that. And so maybe this sermon and the ones to follow will do something to fill that longing and that desire. But more importantly, perhaps will show us how to best proceed in the future as part of the body of Christ. That's what I'm hoping for. So today's text is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 from the New Living Translation. You can follow along in whatever version you have, or you can read silently from the screen. But here's what Luke tells us now. On the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were together in one place, and suddenly... There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Godly Jews from many nations were living in Jerusalem at that time, and when they heard this sound, they came running to see what it was all about, and they were bewildered to hear in their own language, to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. And they were beside themselves with wonder. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking the languages of the lands where we were born. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the areas of Libya beyond Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other, But others in the crowd were mocking. They're drunk, that's all, they said. This passage begins with the words on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival that came 50 days after Passover. It was one of three pilgrimage festivals when Jewish people would gather. They would come and gather in Jerusalem. It's called the Feast of Weeks in Exodus chapter 23. And it celebrated the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. And I thought, how appropriate, now think about this, how appropriate that the event that was going to launch the gospel to the ends of the earth, the event that is going to bring in this great harvest of souls took place when people from the ends of the earth came to Jerusalem to celebrate the harvest. Now, most English versions simply say when the day of Pentecost came or when the day arrived. The King James Version has, I think, an interesting and I think very revealing translation. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. And I think that is a good translation. Because the Greek word here means to fill up, to complete, or to accomplish. That is exactly what happened on Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus. The real meaning of the day was accomplished. The real meaning of the day was filled up, just like the meaning of Passover is fulfilled by Jesus. The real harvest, 
The harvest of people in the kingdom of God was beginning on Pentecost. The day has fully come. The real meaning of Pentecost is seen in what happened on that day and began on that day. And what's so important and meaningful to me is that what happened that day is not an accident. It's not a co- coincidence. It, you know, it just kind of happened on Pentecost. It's not a coincidence any more than Jesus dying at Passover was a coincidence. It is not. All of this is carefully designed and planned and executed by the wisdom and the power and the foreknowledge of God. We just need to see that, folks. These things aren't coincidences. They are not accidents. God has been planning this all along. And so Jesus dies on Passover. The church has, if I can say this, its beginning. The harvest has its beginning on on Pentecost. Jesus died on Passover. Now, on that day, we're told the believers, I think probably all 120 of them that we talked about last week, they're gathered in one place, probably in the upper room of the same house where they had met with Jesus back in chapter 1, verse 4, and where they were waiting and praying, chapter 1, verse 14. And as they are all there together, on that day, suddenly, what Jesus had promised happened. The Holy Spirit came upon them accompanied by three things. Sound, sight, and speech. Now, both the sound of the rushing wind and the tongues of fire that settled on each one of them are symbols of the Holy Spirit. They are symbols of the very presence of God. And then the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in other languages, or some translations, other tongues. Now, nothing else is said about the wind and the fire. Did you notice that? But Luke tells us a whole lot more about the speech. And his emphasis, I believe, is on the international nature of the crowd that came together, drawn to that one place by the sound of the wind. The NIV says there were people there from every nation under heaven. Now, Luke is speaking from his horizon, not ours. Personally, I don't think there were any Native Americans there. I don't think there were any Australian Aborigines there. He's referring to the Greek Roman world that he knew. What's important is that the crowd was multinational, multilingual. So at the very beginning here of the church, we see that barriers are being broken down. A new humanity is being formed by the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't thought about this, I want you to consider it. Pentecost reverses what happened at the Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel, human language was confused. The people are scattered over the face of the earth, Genesis 11, verse 4. But now what happens? People hear the good news in their own language, and they're brought together in one body by the one spirit. And isn't this what God intends the church to always be? Multinational, multicultural, multilingual, multiethnic. What a message in our world that is literally being torn apart right now by cultural and religious and racial disharmony. Only one thing can bring us together, and that is the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit can do that. Now, I do want to say this. It's my opinion that the Holy Spirit had no intention of homogenizing all the people of the world into this uniform Christian culture. I don't think he ever had that intent. He created a new kind of social identity altogether, a fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So what we see in Acts is one church growing in diverse cultures. We're not all the same. People in the church don't all speak the same language. We're not all of the same culture or the same color or anything like that. There is one church, but it is in diverse cultures. And everybody doesn't have to be like us, folks. They don't have to look like us, talk like us, or have the same practices. But we are in one body by the Holy Spirit. Now, the people who heard the disciples speaking in the various, their various languages, according to Luke, were, here's some words, bewildered beside themselves with wonder, amazed, and perplexed. Those are all words you'll find in our text. And one thing that really amazed them, 
that were, was that the speakers were Galileans. And here we see another barrier that God is breaking down. Galileans were nobodies. They were, they were hicks from the backwater, you know, that backwater region up there around the Sea of Galilee. They had no education. They had no economic clout. They had no social standing among the elite. Well, what a message for us. When God chooses to do something great, like what was happening on Pentecost, he doesn't necessarily use people of high standing. He may use them, and he has, but he will use anybody who is open to his leading, anybody who is open to his enlivening and his empowering, and they may come from Galilee or, you know, what other place could we say? They may come from there, but God's even breaking down those kind of social uh, barriers. And, and the lesson for us is that, that when we look at a person's potential, we need to disregard social and economic backgrounds and racial backgrounds and recognize that God has always used people that the world regards as useless and powerless. He has always used those kind of people. Galileans of all folks! We hear them speaking in our own languages. Uh, he has always done that. Now, another thing that the crowd says, we all hear the, these people, these Galileans, speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Some other versions say God's mighty works or the magnificence of God or the wonders of God. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit will always inspire us to say? And the wonders of God here, that's, that's, a, that's the message about Jesus. That's the gospel about what God has done through Jesus Christ. And folks, that's what we need to tell the world. We don't have to air our differences about the millennium or about instrumental music or about church organization. Our message to the world is to be about the mighty work of God revealed in Jesus Christ. We don't need another message. And the Holy Spirit will lead us to do that. Now, at the very end of our text, Luke reveals a very interesting and important fact. Here it is. Not everybody was impressed with the Holy Spirit. Some in the crowd mocked. And they accused the disciples of being drunk. And that shouldn't surprise us. The rejection of the gospel is a theme that you find throughout the book of Acts, throughout the New Testament, and throughout church history right up to the present time, right? And we need to anticipate rejection, and we need not be disillusioned when it comes. In fact, let me tell you this. If everybody's really pleased with our message and patting us on the back for the good things that we're saying, we probably are not being faithful to the gospel. Jesus put it this way, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that's how their ancestors treated the false prophets, Luke 6, 26. So I think it's important for us to remember that, that there will always be people who reject God's word. And if we don't remember that, we can become so upset by their rejection that it will affect our ministry to those who are receptive. And maybe we'll even stop doing it. I'm just not saying anything anymore because people just don't listen. And I'm, it can get to that point and will affect how we deal with those who will hear the message. And rejection, it can make us bitter. This is especially true when you face mockery. Now, simple rejection is one thing. If somebody says, listen, I, I just can't accept what you're saying about Jesus and who he is, that's one thing because those people have considered our message serious enough to, to merit a response. Mockery, on the other hand, is different. It indicates that we're being treated with disdain, that people think we are fools, that we're stupid. And that, if you're not careful, can lead to bitterness it can lead to anger. It can even lead to hatred. And those attitudes are to be avoided at all costs, folks. We cannot live that way. So I would just say to you, don't be surprised and don't become angry or bitter if your message is rejected, even made fun of, because it happened to Jesus 
It happened to his apostles. It happened to the early church. It's happened throughout church history. And let me tell you, it's going on right now. There is a tremendous amount of mockery of Christianity going on right now. Don't let it embitter you. Don't let it lead you to hatred or to anger. Now, let's see. Is there, is there anything else I need to talk about about this? Oh, yes, yeah. I can't ignore the elephant in the room. What about speaking in tongues? Is that for us today? That's not an easy question to answer. I'm not going to give you the standard answer. <laughs> Let me tell you this, that Luke indicates that on Pentecost, the gift of tongues was the ability to speak in other languages. Languages that hadn't been studied, they had not been learned. I do believe that later on when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 about tongues, he may be speaking about something different perhaps. He may be talking about a personal, private prayer language that some people had. I'm not sure of that, but he may be talking about that. But in Acts chapter 2, it's other languages. And unfortunately, tongue speaking has been the focal point of a tremendous amount of division in the church. There are those on one hand who insist that tongues have ceased. They stopped with the close of the apostolic age and the advent of the New Testament canon of scripture and they are not to be sought and sometimes if somebody speaks in tongues they're not even sure that they're Christians on the other end of the spectrum there are those who insist that tongues do still exist and every Christian should speak in tongues and if you don't they're not sure that you are a Christian so we have those two extremes either all Christians practice this gift or nobody practices this gift I think we've got to beware of those extremes. We, we beware of what I want to call charismania, which is just this overemphasis and interest in tongue speaking. We also have to avoid charisphobia, which is the fear of ever talking about that at all. And here is all I can say. Let's leave it to the Holy Spirit to give whatever gifts he desires to give. Remember Paul's words of the Corinthian church. It is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. But all of us can practice the more perfect way, can't we? All of us can practice the way of love. So let's love the brother who speaks in tongues. Let's love the sister who says you can't and doesn't believe anybody should. And let's love everybody in between. Let me tell you, the gift of love will do more to bring people to Christ than any other gift or ability. If people see us loving one another, in spite of some of those differences, it will do more to promote the gospel than anything else. And I leave you with these words written by John the Apostle. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God.